recording should work. Hi everyone, I'm Jan Reuter. I'm one of the developers on SCORE-P, mainly working on our OpenMP and Accelerator support. And today I want to present some of my results of the OpenMP target of loading support in SCORE-P, mainly on what we have achieved over the last one and a half years and what will be included in hopefully the next SCORE-P release. So for a small agenda, what I'll be showing today, I will be giving a short introduction about what is SCORE-P, what is SCORE-P infrastructure, what is the OpenMP tools interface, and what is the support of it. A very short introduction about what is offloading in OpenMP, and then mainly how do we handle offloading events on the host, and what do we do with offloading events actually happening on the accelerators. Then I will present a few results. We'll share a bit of info if a runtime doesn't uh, only have limited support for what we're needing and some final words. So what is SCORE-P? SCORE-P is a highly scalable instrumentation tool. So you are able to instrument your source code by using our compiler wrappers and enable certain adapters to get support for, for example, multi-process adapters, uh, parallelism MPI, HMM, federal parallelism like OpenMP, or accelerators like, uh, like CUDA, HIP, and so on. <clears throat> you also have the option to use uh, enable collection of our metrics like I.O., hardware counters, and so on. And you can do that by compiling your application just once, and collect profile or a trace without needing to recompile the application then again just to change what you want to collect. Scopy has support for C, C++, Fortran and Python via Python bindings and is quite easy to use from my perspective. If you want to use Scopy, normally you replace just the normal call, in this case the NVHPC compiler, by a SCORPI wrapper, which will be, uh, has a prefix of SCORPI dash and any compiler name. And if, if you do it and compile your application, you will you can run it like normally and get a profile as a result. You don't need to do anything else in theory. Um, you can then inspect your profile, for example, to do a tracing afterwards and get a bit of information about it so you can see what functions were called for OpenMP, for example. You also get information about the parallel regions. You get information about barriers which uh, were included and so on. And then just by setting a few environment variables when you're executing the program again, you can also enable tracing to get a bit more information about your application, which I will show next. In general, if you want to have more information about how SCORE-P works, how you can use it, I really recommend a talk by Bernd about using pop tools, SCORE-P and Scalaska. It goes a lot more into detail how SCORE-P works and what you can do to collect all the information. If you run SCORE-P, you could get two kinds of results. If you enable a profile, you will get a so-called QX file, which you can open in an open source viewer named kubegui. And here we can see the metrics collected, like how often the function was visited, the accumulated time of that function. You can see it in the call tree, and you will also get the information which thread did run for how long, for example. If you enable tracing, you will get a lot more information. You will get the actual timeline when each event did happen, start and end. And you can view it with a commercial tool called Vampir, um, which will give you a lot more insight since you will actually see each event. So this talk is mainly about the OpenMP support in SCORE-P. And right now, SCORE-P has two ways to collect information about SCORE-P, uh, about OpenMP. We I did have the Opari 2 instrumentation tool for a very long time. Opari 2 is a source-to-source -source instrumentation tool. So you put in your source code Opari adds some things to, so that SCORPI can collect information and then the actual source code is compiled. It's great because it's independent from the compiler being used, but it's quite hard to maintain. It has issues with newer OpenMP constructs, for example, which is why instrumentation is 
granted up to OpenMP 3x and has also various limitations, for example, with new C++ standards and combined directives, especially with SIMD. So your source code sometimes has to be prepared that Opari actually works. On the other hand, the OpenMP interface, uh, the, the OpenMP API contains uh, the OpenMP tools interface since OpenMP 5, which enables tools to use any compiler, any compiler runtime supporting these tools interface and write a tool, for example, for performance measurements, correctness tools, and so on. And what's great is that since it's in the OpenMP standard, it supports also the latest and greatest OpenMP features and is expanded with uh, new versions. So a bit more detail, what is the OpenMP tools interface? Uh, the OpenMP tools interface is described as an interface for first party tools, which can be linked or loaded into the OpenMP program. I list here three options how you can do that. For example, if you have my program Red C, you can link it into your application by just linking it with my tool, for example. You can compile it in your tool, and you're also able to load it at runtime by setting OMP2 libraries. The OpenMP tool interface is completely defined by the OpenMP, OpenMP standard and then has to be implemented by the OpenMP runtimes, for example, LLVM or uh, GCC. Um, what tool developers have to implement are functions to interact with this interface. So tools need to be implement, for example, OMPT start tool so that the runtime can hook into your tool you're writing and start up the whole interaction sequence. The main interaction we're using are callbacks. So you're able to register callbacks, which are invoked for runtime events. How does it look like? For example, if you have a very simple program just with a parallel loop, your source code will do something in a runtime, prepare this parallel region, this parallel region will be executed. The runtime will then dispatch parallel begin event to our tool so that we know, okay, a parallel region is about to begin. And we also get the information from each thread, which will be part of this parallel region, that it will start an implicit task. Since we have a for also here, we will get the information that some loop will start, then all loop iterations will run through, and at the end we will get the information a loop has finished. Since parallel and for also have an implicit barrier at the end of the for loop, uh, at the end of the paradigm, we'll also get the information that a barrier is about to begin and end, and with that we can build the whole structure in scope here measure the information about how long this parallel region took, how long did the work, so the loop construct inside this parallel region took, and so on. We have support for OMPT since Scorpi 8, which was released at the end of 2022. Back then, and even right now in 8.4, um, OMPT was not the default. So if you compile something with OpenMP support, you normally would get Opari. But you could select OMPT either during configure time as default or if you compile something, add the option dash dash thread equals OMP OMPT and then this adapter would get enabled. <clears throat> in Scorpi 8, we tried to match the features which were available in Pari 2, so mainly focused on OpenMP 3x, which means that a lot of constructs which were added in newer OpenMP versions were either not working or not fully supported. Um, during the 8.x development cycle, we had to add a few new features so that compilers still work fine. For example, NVIDIA has added support for loop schedules, so we needed to add support for, for it or else you wouldn't see any information about loops anymore. And also, the OMP test lock event uh, was fixed in LLVM runtimes and we had to add support for it because otherwise testing for locks would break Scorpi. So in the upcoming release in Scorpi 9, we will expand the OpenMP support in several ways. For the host side first, we have several improvements to the support of task directors. For example, dependencies and tasks would cause issues with Scopy right now, but in the next release, um, this will be supported. 
it is partially supported just because we don't record the actual dependencies since we don't consume it at any point right now. But um, you can take measurements and we'll get all information. Secondly, we improve support for cancel. I haven't seen much codes using OpenMP cancel yet, but we do have support for it. Similar to task depend, we don't record the actual cancel and cancellation point events, but they work fine now. So you will get information about everything else and the measurements don't abort anymore, simply. Third, we have support for the OpenMP Teams directive coming, which was necessary to also correctly support the target events. Basically, the OpenMP Teams directive and OpenMP distribute will now be supported just like everything else. You will get information about it. And lastly, um, while reduction didn't cause any issues, we now support the reduction clause, so you will actually see it in your measurements. What isn't supported yet by Scope P is the scope directive. It's quite easy. There is right now no runtime which gives us the event, and therefore we decide to not implement it to make sure that nothing breaks once a compiler starts supporting it. In general, for the compiler support for MPT, um, Scopy has quite strict requirements to allow even using OMPT. Um, firstly, which should be clear, OpenMP runtimes have to implement the tools interface or else we are not able to support it, which is the case for GCC. If GCC, don't, uh, GCC hasn't implemented anything yet, so we can't use it. Secondly, there might be runtimes which have bugs or features not fully implemented. For example, the Cray 16 compilers had issues where overdue events were not dispatched, which would simply mean we wouldn't get all events, which would cause user applications to abort, and this is not something we want. The same is true for CC 17, where some events aren't dispatched or are dispatched in an incorrect way and would simply cause Scopy to abort a measurement. To make sure that uh, measurements work, even if there are some runtime, bug pre uh, runtime bugs present, we do some tests during configuration, which will shown in the overview. And inside of Scopy, we will change some code paths to make sure that everything works. For example, with the latest One API release, there are still issues with um, testing for open P mutexes and also loop schedules. So we shift things around that everything works fine. To ensure that everything works, we do a lot of testing in Scopy. Uh, over the last year, I've built up a large internal test suite, which is mainly based on the OpenMP examples and some additional tests I've included, and test regularly Scopy against them with GCC, Clang, NVHPC, Rock and One API, since these are the compilers which are freely and easily available. Um, what it allows us is to test every single feature addition for OpenMP against all our tests to make sure that nothing breaks. And it also allows us to test new compilers as soon as they release, which is sometimes quite important. One good example is the NVHPC 24.5 compiler, which was released last week, and does show differences in the runtime, for example, with tasking. And we have to investigate it to make sure that new compiler releases don't break things. The CI has also contributed to several bug reports to all compiler vendors um, and also workarounds in Scope if it is possible for us to include a workaround at all. Now to the main question, how do we handle the offloading to accelerators in Scope P? So in last month's talk, it was shown how OpenMP target in general looks like and especially with asynchronous GPU programming. So I will keep it short here. And OpenMP 4.0, the target support offloading to a GPU was introduced for the first time. And it looks quite simple. If you have some FRT, for example, SAXP, you can use the Pragma OMP target directive and everything coming next in this braces or example here, uh, here the for loop will be offloaded to a GPU. This is not a great example since this will only use a very small part of the GPU, 
but it's just an example to how it generally works. In later spec versions of OpenMP, many features were added, including additional functions to allow allocating memory on a GPU, moving memory between hosts and GPU or between two GPUs. Um, so I would say the, the OpenMP standard now is quite large in re relation to what you can do on GPUs. What might be simple optimization steps, and I wanted to mention them here, is a data movement can be quite expensive. So you may want to do things like making sure that you don't do too many data transfers or reuse data if it's possible and transfer the data beforehand, maybe even asynchronously. So in this example, I have just two very simple methods which use the same data and have some data directives inside of it and I just make sure that data is uh, transferred beforehand so that um, you don't increase your compute time just because you're transferring data and doing nothing else. So if we take the simple sex by example, we do need two types of events to create some kind of information in SCORE-P. We do need information on the host side. For example, when the CPU thread has encountered this target region or takes place in some data transfers or submits a kernel, which will be executed at some point. And for the accelerator, we do need some information when did the data operation actually take place, when the kernel was actually executed and so on. The OpenMP tools interface includes information for both of it. And I will focus on both independently. First, for the host side, um, I've, I've shown earlier that um, there are callbacks which will get invoked, for example, for parallel region. And this is the same for target directives. So what we can do in Scorpi is register a few additional events which correlate to the begin of a target region, the begin of a data transfer that we tr uh, submit some kernel to the GPU. And like we already have, we will get a callback which informs us, okay, the runtime will soon start a target region or is inside of a target region. And we can write a start and an end event in the host and get all the information we would need. Notably, this includes not only directives like OMP target, but also certain function calls. For example, an OMP target mem copy will give us information about data transfers, even when it's not a directive. Um, in the OMPT interface, we do have these three callbacks. We have a callback for target, for the submit of a kernel and the target data up. These three callbacks give us almost all the information we need to write our events. We do get information about, is it the start and the end of an operation? So that we know, okay, a region is about to start and a region is about to end. We know what exactly is done. So what the user has requested to do, for example, for target, we need to know, was it target enter data, target exit data? Was it just a simple target region? And for target data op, we need to know, was it an allocation? Did the user want to free memory? Was, user, uh, was memory copied from a device to a host or in, in what order and so on. We also get information about the source code position. So a lot of callbacks do have this code pointer RA, which we can resolve to the code position in the user's code. And we are able to set unique information per target region in target data and also able to set information about each operation as an ID. This will help us to correlate events between not only the accelerator and the host, but also between host events if needed. Looking a bit further into the correlation, like I've mentioned, we do need to correlate some host callbacks and accelerator events, and we can do that with the target data and target host. But what need, exactly needs to be transferred? Right now, we transferred in target data a whole struct of information. 
This includes simple things like the target ID, which will just be incremented by one for each target region that will be executed so that we can uniquely identify a target region and its data transfers and so on. We have a small Boolean just telling us if the GPU where an event is happening on supports device tracing. This is important for us since if we don't have device tracing, we only want to write events to the host and want to free memory if necessary. And then the not so obvious one is the code pointer RA. Why do we store it here if callbacks give us this information? And we do that for two reasons. One, of, uh, one is the target submit callback you can see on the right doesn't contain the code pointer. And we do want to add this code pointer so that users know where they have submitted their kernel, which is even more important on the GPU later in the accelerator events, since otherwise there would just be, there was a kernel without any particular naming or information where this kernel did happen. And also um, some runtimes, mainly NVHPC, may change the code pointer begin to be, uh, between the begin and the end of a region, which is also not great, at least for us in Scopy, since we write events based on this particular region, which is identified also by the code pointer. Then for your host op ID, we mainly actually write the ID, but we also transfer some data about which host thread things run on. This is transferred by the device tracing interface but we have some internal structures where we need to transfer them as well to make sure that, for example, data transfers are later shown correctly between the host thread, which did the transfer and the GPU. This is mainly just for scope here reasons. Then there is how we handle the accelerator. And for this, there is the device tracing interface defined in the OpenMP specification. What is it? The, open, uh, the device tracing interface is mainly a buffer-based handling of accelerated events. For those who are aware of it, you could compare it to things like CUPD or Rock Tracer. When we get the information that the device will be initialized, we can choose to enable this interface by asking the runtime, can you please collect information about target regions or kernels or data transfers? If that all succeeds and we can enable this interface, the runtime will ask us for buffers during the runtime of the program via a certain callback we register. It will record these events for us. And if buffers are full or we want to flush these buffers manually, we will get the information that the buffer has finished. And at that point, we are able to record these accelerator events. There are certain things we need to do from a tool perspective. The buffers we will receive may need to be sorted since runtimes are not required to do it. We also need to convert, convert the timestamps we're receiving inside of these buffer records because these timestamps might correlate to GPU timestamps and not the one you're recording on your host normally. You have two ways to do it or either manually what we are doing or via OMPT translate time. And we decide to do it manually since OMPT translate time returns a double value, which is not sufficient for us. And the last step, which is quite obvious, is we actually need to iterate through the buffer and write our events. Um, this, these buffers contain a number of records. And what does a record tell us? we know which type of event will be recorded. For example, is this a target region? Is this a data transfer versus a kernel? Quite simple. We get the device time, which we need to convert to actual time on the host. We get information about which thread did, did, uh, did do something. We get our target data back as part of the target ID field. And mainly and most importantly, we get the actual record. So via the type, we can find out which part of this union this record belongs to and get our information, which is quite similar to what we've seen on the host callbacks, but may contain more information. For example, for a kernel, we do get our host OPID back. So it allows us to match host and device activity. 
but we also get the end time. So we have everything to write a kernel. We know when it started in the time field, we know when it's ended in the end time field. If we convert both, we can write these events. So if we bo use both callbacks and device tracing interface, we can almost do everything we need to do. We can have our target event, which can we can write on the host. We know when the callback was submitted, a uh, target, target kernel was submitted. We do get uh, the, the kernel itself in the device tracing interface. And by having the correlation IDs, we can also correlate these events so that both have the same ID and it's great. So how can a user use this new feature? The good news is there is nothing large the user need, needs to do. With Scopy 9, we're planning to do uh, to make the OpenMP tools interface a default if it's available for a certain chosen compiler. And then if you have the development version right now, you just can call your compiler like normal in at your offloading flex so that your target regions will run on a GPU and run the application like normal. And in this example, tracing is enabled, so we'll also get trace events as well. If device tracing cannot be activated, the uh, Scopy or more specific, specifically the OMPT adapter will inform you about this. You will get an information or more warning that device tracing could not be enabled and that the OMPT adapter will not record any uh, events on a GPU. It will still record events on the host, so you might get some information. How do these results look like? So for a simple case, you just have a target region with 6p, you will get a profile which look, looks like this. You can see your target region. You can see that some memory was allocated and freed because of the arrays, which will get transferred to the target region. You can see that the kernel was submitted and you will see that the kernel was executed. And since we only used target and didn't add any more directives, which actually distributed work on a GPU correctly, we will also see we requested only a very small part of the GPU and also only got this very small part of the GPU. When we looked at the trace results, we also see some lines which correspond to the actual data transfers which happened. And we can better see when the kernel actually uh, ran in contrast to how much time the host did spend on submitting this kernel and waiting for it to complete. Then we can just increase our problem size. This example is a Jacobi example we use in Scorpy testing mostly, and I've brought it to the GPU so that the whole algorithm aside from the initialization will run on it. And you could see it clearly at the beginning of the program, all the data will be initialized. This will be done on the CPU. You have some initial data transfers at the beginning, which you can see is here a target enter data and at the end target exit data. And afterwards, the whole algorithm will run on a, a GPU. You have the first step, the first target region, the second target region. The first target region will not need to do any additional transfers. And the second target region will do quite small transfers of four bytes to keep track if we still need to do iterations or a bore out of it because we're finished. You again see the kernels, you get the information about target regions and everything else. So it's great and it works on a small scale. The next step is to bring it to a larger system to ensure that it works as well. And during my testing, I chose the Lumi HPC cluster in Finland to do exactly that. I did choose one of the spec HPC benchmarks, did take two Lumi G nodes, which include four MI250s from AMD, and ran the spec benchmark with the AOMP compiler. So I brought it manually on the cluster and compiled Scopy with it. And it worked extremely well out of the box. So again, we get all the information about target regions and what we also can see here is if I highlight one of the target regions, we will see what kernel launch and the CPU it belongs to. And we also see for GPU, what 
rank or what thread did dispatch this kernel to the GPU, which might be helpful for analysis. Uh, if you look at the trace, it will get quite messy since back benchmarks include a lot of calls, both function calls, kernels, and so on. But if you zoom in to a very small part, you will see the same information again. You will see that kernels got submitted, kernels got executed. In red, you can see the MPI communication as well. So MPI barriers, for example, and other even smaller kernels, which are shown here. Data transfers can be seen again. So you will get all the information which are only based on open on the OpenMP adapter, which is great. What I also want to mention, though, are limitations. And some of those are based on the OpenMP spec. Right now, the device tracing interface doesn't give us any information about what's actually happening at a low level. For example, in CUDA, you can select that certain events run on a certain stream. In OpenMP, we don't get information about that. So to handle events which might overlap, like shown here on the right, we do need to create some we call OpenMP virtual streams. The benefit is we still get all information, but the drawback is that we may get more of these virtual streams that actually be created by the runtime, or we might even miss the creation of some of them. So. The results, at least in the number of locations created, might not be accurate to what's actually happening under the hood. Secondly, OpenMP runtimes also still have runtime issues. We generally recommend the latest releases as they are the most stable. And I would say that both the latest Rockham and AOMP release are quite good, but there are still bugs you may run into and may have to uh, work around if you want to measure uh, information. Then there's the question of what about my runtime which doesn't support device tracing? A good example is NVHPC, which does support everything from a target side, but not device tracing. In that case, SCOP will output the warning as shown before reminding that OMPT will not collect accelerator data, but host events will be recorded and you can still use a native GPU adapter to collect this information. For example, for NVIDIA GPUs, we do support CUDA and with this, we get our information. To show it off, I did use Jules Booster, a system we have here at the JC, at the research center, used NVHPC 23.7 and did run a smaller scales back benchmark on one node with four A100 GPUs. And we do get all the information like we've seen before. So we know when a kernel was launched and how the kernel looks like. However, the kernels are hard to correlate to your actual source code, which is bad. The kernel launches may be hard to correlate to target regions, especially in the trace. And some runtimes may behave a bit differently. NVHPC is a good example where even though the kernel did take 60 seconds on the GPU, the host site only shows one second because um, the lower level driver calls actually causes uh, cause the synchronization to happen and this lower level call was actually the mem copy, which waited for the kernel to finish. So what did I show in this talk, uh, just as a small overview? With SCORE P9, we will expand support for OpenMP in several ways. And most important, I think, is that users will be able to uh, record OpenMP target events. And right now, AMD compilers both suffi sufficiently support the OpenMP tools interface and from my point of view, also have great support for it. For other compilers, you may get all the host events, but you may also need to activate native accelerator adapters to get everything you need. We did have to make some compromises, partially because of the OpenMP 5.2 specification. Um, 
<clears throat> but we were able to show that the implementation already works on several different systems, both on a small scale like my workstation up to HPC systems like Lumi and uh, Jules Booster, which is great. If you're interested in trying it out, here is both a QR code and a link where you can get access to the latest development table. With the reminder, it's still in development, so things might break. Right now, it should mostly work as far as I'm aware of. And if you want to get more information in general, I recommend visiting both our web page. Also check out the GitLab mirror where we have our release versions and the latest master version. And if you just want to install Scorpy, there are seven different way, ways available. For example, in the package repositories of Fedora, you can use our Ubuntu PPA, install it via easy build spec. And I'm also working on updating the version in OpenHPC. With that, I would thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jan, for this uh, very interesting talk and this nice summary. Um, I, yeah, uh, Adam, uh, you have a question. Uh, please unmute and uh, ask. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for that uh, webinar. It was really, 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 really interesting. Um, when you were talking about the device tracing interface, you uh, mentioned how you have to convert timestamps from the device to the host time. Um, and you said that you are you often do that manually because you require uh, you, the old PC translate time is going to double, but that's not for you. So how do you do the manual translating of timestamps to the host time? Um, we do it quite similarly to what AMD is doing in their implementation to give us a double timestamps. So um, when the device is initialized, we will take timestamps for the first time both on the host and the device, and when we evaluate the device as a buffer we do it the second time to get an interval and from there we can just make a very simple conversion between these timestamps i hope that i described it good <laughs> yeah actually so you, so you record a, a, a baseline timestamp when the exactly. device is initialized and then everything is an offset from that timestamp exactly yeah okay thank you very much um in addition, but you kind of um, hope that basically the the clocks run in the same speed at that at, at, at time. So, like if like if the GPU was run clock would run slower or faster, at some point the the the, the time set would divert. Yeah, we do respect it in the implementation. We update this conversion function every single time a new buffer is evaluated. So we make okay. sure that we don't, uh, even if these timers diverge, that we don't have issues because of So that. you do that at multiple times, not just at the beginning. OK, yeah. I get it. OK. Um, I have another question from Pramod. Um, any constraints in terms of which compiler tool sets are supported today? Yeah, he, he came a little bit late, so he, he passed it. So perhaps you just show it uh, again. I, I, uh, yeah, I can do that. One moment. And I can also say it yeah, quite quickly. Yeah. So um, if you want to have support for device tracing, you only really are able to use the AMD compilers right now. Uh, both Rockham and AOMP have sufficient support, Rockham with some limitations. And if you want to get it's just the host events, you can also use other compilers like Clang and the HPC and um, one API. And this will give you the host information and you will need to use a native GPU adapter as well to get the remaining information. Okay, um, then uh, JP, you can unmute. JP, Leah, yeah. Okay, I think now I selected the right yep. microphone and you can hear me. Okay, sorry for that. Uh, great talk. Thank, thank you for uh, thank you for the, the good overview of the of Score P and OMPT. Uh, I was wondering, do you have any like insight on how the OMPT um, way of collecting things interplays with the uh, potential filtering of regions? 
and how like return addresses and code regions may be messed up or potentially confuse the cube writer or anything? That's a good question. <laughs> um, so I have a question back. What do you mean exactly with filtering? So Scopy allows to filter regions in theory by, for example, giving the function names. For OMPT, we don't support it right now. Yeah. So... Okay. So um, what I was wondering is some time back, I did experiments where I used compile time filtering um to filter out regions and then in certain like weird situations potentially the cube writer got confused about the consistency of region identifiers it encountered in start and end events and so i was wondering if there could be some um potentially like weird situations coming where ompt things that return address is from somewhere else than the actual cube know that you have inside the the writer at the time you get the the callback or something so for OMPT we do also do manual lookups for these code pointers and most of the time it works with address to line there are a few issues where this lookup fails and this may happen for example because of the runtime there is an issue often for uh, open for LLVM for right now um but i haven't seen these issues yet but maybe we can run into it okay i guess that you haven't seen these issues yet is good good for a uh, good pointer thank you okay then we have a question from piero uh, what about open acc support in scorpion 9.0 uh, we actually already support OpenACC as an adapter. Um, OpenACC is mainly done on the host, so you will get information about that. And for GPU, you will need to activate a GPU adapter as well. Okay. And then, Adam, you have a second question? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so could you, do you have an experience using um, LLVM compilers to do uh, tracing device offloads. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Uh, the question was about using LLVM to uh, trace device offloads. Yeah, so LLVM right now contains uh, all of the host events for device uh, for for the OMPT side. So you will get information about everything I've shown, but device tracing is missing since AMD is mainly implementing it and has only brought it to their compilers right now. And um, therefore you will only get the host site with LLVM. Um, here in the, in the table, the target site is, is shown as partial and this is only because LLVM uses helper threads for asynchronous events, which do not conform with the OpenMP specification, but you can disable them and still get all your host events without issues. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, have you any further questions? Looks like that. So thanks again, Jan, and thanks again, everyone, for, for joining us in our um, event today. Um, the recording um, and the slides will be made available uh, as soon, hopefully this week, and uh, you will get notified about it, and uh, you will find it, as usual, on the POP website or on the POP uh, YouTube channel. So thanks, everyone, for, for joining, and have a nice rest of the week. Bye-bye. Thanks for your time.